and I call Gordon Linters. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its response to the recent severe weather. John Swinney. Presenting officer, last week's severe weather, which included the first ever red warning for snow, posed significant challenges across Scotland. The Scottish Government's dedicated resilience operation, which <coughs> monitors weather and flood alerts all year round, was activated in advance of the severe weather and continued to meet regularly to ensure ministers were kept fully updated on any developing issues. The operation also worked closely with Scotland's network of resilience partnerships, which brings together emergency services, local authorities, health boards, power companies and others to ensure that we understood any challenges happening on the ground and could offer support and guidance where necessary. This process enabled strong and decisive management of a challenging situation and ensured that practical public safety guidance was issued in advance of each change in the warning level. The Scottish Government Resilience Room facility remains active while we monitor the national recovery and any potential impacts of flooding that follow the thaw of the snow. Gordon Winters. I thank the Minister for that reply. I would like to commend all emergency services and other workers who battled with the severe conditions to, to keep Scotland going over the last week. And I would like to thank everyone who banded together to help out in their local communities and uh, I would also say it is clear the severe weather disrupted the Scottish economy with estimates of loss due to closure of high streets and goods unable to be transported ranging in the hundreds of millions of pounds. We saw for the second time this year people in cars stuck on motorways and we saw trains not running. Will the Minister be assessing whether improvements to infrastructure to mitigate the effects of extreme winter weather can be undertaken to enable even better responses in future? And what can be learned from other countries more familiar with severe weather? John Swinney. Um, first of all, let me associate the government with the comments that Mr. Lintard has made about the role of the emergency services and also about um, countless volunteers the length and breadth of the country who have made a, an extraordinary contribution to supporting individuals during this period of, of, of severe weather, but also in bringing about the rapid recovery from that. In relation to the question of economic disruption, Mr Lintarsh will have seen the varying analysis about economic impact. The Fraser Valander Institute, for example, um, said yesterday that they did not believe the economic impact was uh, as severe as others were predicting, because essentially, the um, resources that individuals may not have spent last Wednesday, they were likely to spend this Wednesday because they could get to the shops, which they couldn't do last Wednesday. So I think that I acknowledge the, um, there will be economic disruption and the challenge for government is to work with all of our partners to try to minimise that as far as possible. That brings me on to the, the latter part of Mr Lintar's question, where after every severe weather incident, the government undertakes a, a review of how that has been handled to identify if there are any lessons that can be learnt. I think one of the key lessons that was applied in this instance was the very early, timely and specific warnings that were given to avoid travel, which reduced significantly the volume of traffic on our transport network and, as a consequence, resulted in... Um, uh, many fewer uh, motorists and travellers being stranded in our transport networks than, than would have been the case had we not given such clear warnings about this. In relation to other jurisdictions, of course we look at other countries. And part of the debate we have to have is about what is the level of resourcing and resilience that we ordinarily should have in place uh, to manage such circumstances. Obviously, there is a lot more could be spent to uh, provide for these events, but we also have to be mindful of the fact that we don't face these events on every single year. So there's a balance to be struck there. And I think what was clear to me over the course of the last week or so was that we do have a resilience capacity which is able to be moved around the country to meet, um, uh, to, to assist other parts of the country that are fa facing more difficult challenges. And that's an important part of the collaborative arrangements that the government has put in place. Gordon Lindhurst. Um, I thank the Minister for that reply. The impact on our roads becomes ever clearer as the snow thaws and recedes. 
We learned recently of the 20% S&P cut to pothole funding since 2010, and the effects of that have been certainly seen all too clearly here in Edinburgh. Given the potentially significant and additional damage to our roads as a result of the recent severe weather, is the government able to give a commitment to provide more support for our roads networks and local authorities to cope with this additional repair burden coming, as has been indicated, um, as perhaps a, an exception to what we're used to as weather here? John Swinney. Uh, Presiding officer, the, the government itself has uh, taken action to increase the resources that we put in place for road maintenance, and uh, we increased that by £45 million in the budget. In relation to local authorities, obviously local authorities uh, have to take their own decisions about the level in which they invest in, in roads. Um, the Conservative Council in my area, for example, did not invest as much in road repairs this year as the SNP group proposed in the budget process, which is a matter of great regret to me that that was the case, so it varies around the country. Um, we have, as a government, activated the Bellwin formula, which has um, made available to local authorities the opportunity to put forward claims of um, extraordinary expenditure that are as associated with handling um, these, uh, these incidents, and obviously any applications to the Bellwin, uh, through the Bellwin formula will be considered in due course by the Finance Secretary and local authorities will be advised. Uh, I have four members who wish to ask a question. If we are fairly sharp with questions and answers, everyone will get in. Ross Greer. Thank you. The SDUC have collected stories across the country of workers who have been treated shockingly during the extreme weather by employers who have told them that they have to turn up to work despite the weather warnings, putting them and their customers in danger. The First Minister and the Transport Minister have made welcome statements. Could the Deputy First Minister outline what the Scottish Government are going to do to defend workers' rights during extreme weather conditions? John Swinney. The first thing to say is that um, uh, whilst I except that there have been some people who have been treated um, uh, badly by their employers. There, has been, there have been a large number of individuals who have been well treated and, and, uh, uh, and, and appropriately treated by their employers um, in not being asked to undertake journeys that would put them at risk. Um, the government has, uh, yesterday the government met with the Scottish Trade Union Congress as part of our ongoing dialogue with the STUC. Um, we agreed to work together to collaboratively develop a fair work charter that focused on the treatment of work that focuses on the treatment of workers affected by severe weather or other emergencies. That is work that we will take forward as part of our ongoing relationship with the STUC. Obviously, we do that within the context of employment law and employment rights not being a devolved function, but we will do as much as we possibly can do within our areas of legislative competence to make sure that workers are properly protected from being asked to undertake journeys or to attend work when it is patently unsafe for them to do so. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary about the statement the Minister of Transport may, meant about, may, made, apologise, about deduction of wages? I contacted the two councils, Mayor Midlothian Council has paid in full all employees who couldn't get to work during particularly the red warning time, but Scottish Borders Council are only giving one day of full pay, otherwise they're asking those who couldn't work at any point to actually take it either off their flexi time or leave to make up the absences. Now, to me, that is docking wages by another name. Can I ask if the Cabinet Secretary or the Minister of Transport would raise this issue with COSLA? John Swinney. Uh, we, we certainly will be very happy to take forward discussion on this question with, uh, with local authorities. Um, as I said in my earlier answer to Mr Greer, we think it is important. And our dialogue with the STUC reinforces this point that individuals are treated fairly and appropriately. Um, as uh, Christine Graham cites, um, Midlothian Council have taken um, an appropriate approach in that respect, uh, but we will be happy to raise these questions with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities to ensure that there is fairness for individuals who are affected by these circumstances. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary made reference to the opening of the Bellwin scheme, and that's a very welcome decision. But will he acknowledge that, that the scheme's criteria can be 
overly restrictive. It only covers, for example, actions that deal with saving life and limb. Um, there's a huge threshold there for local authorities to have to, to pay first before they receive any funding from the government, and it only covers actions that are taken in a very short period of time. Now, given that there is precedent for this, will the government consider awarding further funding to local councils to deal with what will be a substantial mm -hmm clean-up costs right across Scotland, not just in those authorities that will qualify for the Bellwyn scheme. John Swinney. Well, the, the government will uh, remain open to dialogue with local authorities about this question, but you know, I think we've got to, we've got to look at this um, across a, a wider perspective. Um, not every winter is as severe as the one that we have um, experienced. Indeed, um, in the winter last year, there was much less recourse to some of the uh, snow clearing and gritting operations than, um, than were required this year, uh, last year. Uh, so local authorities will not have to will not have had to spend uh, last year as much as they will ha they will have had to spend this year. So there is a, a need for us to um, look at that in the round. Um, the Bellwyn scheme is available there to support local authorities with exceptional costs. That's what it's designed to do. Um, but the government will remain open to dialogue with individual local authorities and with COSLA uh, on all of these questions. And the last question is from Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The major incident resulting from the severe weather was the hundreds of vehicles stranded overnight on the M80. Will the Cabinet Secretary comment on Police Scotland's response to this incident, and in particular, when police first attended, how long they were there for, and the strategy um, which Police Scotland put in place to deal with the incident, given reports that there was a miscommunication between the former Strathclyde and Central Legacy Forces, now the Greater Glasgow and Lanarkshire Division, which resulted in neither responding tenuously to deal with the incident. John Swinney. Well, I, um, I haven't seen the speculation that uh, Margaret Mitchell refers to, but um, from my involvement in this instance, uh, the police were on the ground handling this issue from the minute the difficulties arose. Yeah. And indeed, I spent a prolonged uh, amount of time, as did Mr Yousaf, on Wednesday evening, um, talking directly to the police commander who was on the M80 in the freezing conditions, explaining to us what was going on. And uh, the difficulty that was experienced at the M80 was the fact that a number of vehicles could not obtain traction in either climbing out of the, uh, up from the hill from Castle Carey or uh, in either direction. Um, that was caused significantly by the fact that we had a large number of HGVs in that area, none of whom who could reach, uh, achieve traction. And the, on various occasions, um, and Mr Yousaf and I were involved in calls throughout that evening, uh, the operating companies were trying everything possible to grit the roads, to create a more solid uh, surface upon which vehicles could gain traction, but their efforts were unsuccessful. And I can vouch to Margaret Mitchell that all of that effort was going on. The police were there throughout the whole incident. They were handling a very difficult situation to handle, um, but these, the conditions were very, very poor. That is why the minister gave such clear warnings to reduce travel on Tuesday. Um, and we intensified those warnings on Wednesday morning when the red warning came to us. And anyone listening to those warnings should have thought twice about going anywhere near the M80, because it's no surprise to any of us that the hills up and down at Castle Carey uh, cause these difficulties during winter. So I assure Margaret Mitchell the police were absolutely all over the incident. Um, were giving us quality information from the scene of the incident and I put on record my thanks to the police officers who were out on that motorway in the freezing cold for giving us such quality information as we handled the issue. That concludes topical questions. We'll move on to the next item of business. <coughs>